Hello, and welcome to The Hump with Katie Thoreau. I'm your host, Katie Thoreau, and I'm bringing you interviews with some incredible artists, finding out why are they so amazing, how did it all happen, and what can we learn from their journey. Before we get started today, I'd like to thank our sponsors. And first up, we have Jams World. Okay, by now, you all know how much I love Jams World. I'm wearing a Jams World right now. It's a family-owned and operated clothing company based in Honolulu, Hawaii since 1964. Their clothing keeps you so cool and so comfortable because it's made from 100% spun crushed rayon. And all their art is real art screen printed onto the fabric. So it makes me feel like I'm wearing something made just for me. Go to jamsworld.com and use the promo code JAZZ15 to get 15% off your entire purchase. That's jamsworld.com. Next up, we have Colsteins. Colsteins, again, it's one of my favorite places in the entire world. It's an amazing string shop based in Long Island, New York. And they do everything from building instruments to repairing instruments. They make beautiful double basses, they make their own strings and rosin. They do it all. It's like going to the Disneyland of bases. If you go to Colstein.com and use the promo code KD10, you'll get 10% off your entire purchase. Or give them a call and you'll get 10% off as well. So that's Colstein.com. And last but not least, I'd like to thank DiscoverDoubleBass.com. This is a wonderful online resource for bass players. No matter what stage you are in your career of playing bass, you can be beginner, intermediate, super pro. I find stuff on there all the time that I, I'm learning from. They have a really cool YouTube channel with tons of free lessons. So go give them a look. That's DiscoverDoubleBass.com. I'd like to remind you that I'm bringing you brand new episodes of The Hump every Wednesday, every hump day. Download and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and follow us on Instagram, at The Hump with KD. You don't want to miss a beat of what's going on over here. Okay, I am beyond thrilled to bring you our guest today, the wonderful bassist, vocalist, and educator, Kristen Korb. I call her the teacher, and not just because she was my teacher, but she's taught so many others, and she's always finding a way to give back, because that's how she received the knowledge. I had so much fun catching up with her. We talked about her very humble beginnings of learning bass, to her amazing mentorship with Ray Brown, and now she's living in Denmark, tearing it up on the scene. And we got to talk a lot about the ups and downs that the music business can bring. I know you're going to enjoy this interview with Kristen Korb. So without further ado, here's Kristen Korb. Welcome to The Hump. And uh, I don't know, I haven't been asking people this, but what does what does that mean to you, like The Hump? Because it means something to me, specific. Yeah, well, we're uh, well, in the same family, so. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's all about the quarter note. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. So. Yeah, I, I had that feeling when you were when you wrote me about the hump. I was like, oh yeah, the the hump and the quarter note, absolutely. Yeah, so I'm trying to bring um, non bass players into our world, you know, even non musicians. Yeah. But even releasing it on Hump Day gives another reference, and mm-hmm. yeah, so yeah, it works. <laughs> <laughs> well, I kind of want to get started. It's it's so great because I know you through you are my teacher. And but actually, and then getting to see you perform when you were living in Los Angeles, and uh, really looking up to you. But I kind of want to get just a little bit of a handle on kind of how how did that all happen? I know you you grew up in Montana, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, I grew up in Montana, but we had some years. Um, my kindergarten through junior high years were in Boise, Idaho. Oh, okay, and. And even though Jean Harris was living there, um, I wasn't really aware of that. My dad knew him. Didn't mm-hmm. find out till like I was 20. So my dad was like, oh, Jean Harris. Yeah. Used to see him all the time at the Eidenhaw Hotel. I was like, great. Thanks, Dad. dad. Yeah. <laughs> but um, the music programs in Boise, Idaho were really jazz um, focused. Mm-hmm. So when I was in sixth grade on the cafetorium floor of uh, you know, the junior high groups came through and there was like the, the orchestra and I was like, eh, it's all right. And then there was the, the concert band and I was like, eh. <laughs> and then the East J- junior high mad jazz singers came out. The mad and jazz like, singers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because for the first half of the year, they sang madrigals. Oh, okay. And for the second half of the year, um, so they would do as a select group. It was like, 
maybe 30 students Mm -hmm. in the group. But when they did the the spring tour of the elementary schools, they would always do the jazz program. So they had their own student rhythm section and people, they each had their own microphone and the girls had really cool dresses and the guys, you know, had regular ties and not the bow tie thing that the orchestra and the band kids had. Yeah. Uh, they smiled, moved to the music, did this weird scat thing. And I was like, whoa, I want to be in the band. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I was playing guitar at the time. And so my had my guitar teacher called the choir director and he said, well, it's not a guitar. I was <laughs> like, I don't care. Yeah. Whatever it is, I want to play it. Mm-hmm. And so my parents drove me to school seven o'clock in the morning every day. Uh, for the first part of seventh grade, just so I could get my hands on the electric bass. Mm. And by the time my birthday rolled around in October, my birthday present was an electric bass because oh, they, cool. they got tired of driving me to school every morning and yeah. I would stay after school and I was in the choir room during lunch and um, our choir director played jazz all the time mm. in the classroom. And the big painting on the back of the choir room wall was the Manhattan transfer. Okay. That silhouette of theirs. Mm -hmm. And it was just, you know, real books on the piano. And it was just really this place where if you just started asking questions, he would, you know, kind of point us in direction. Like you're asking too many questions. I'm going to drive you to a jazz camp. So at a time where teachers were allowed to drive students. Yeah. So, Check this out. This will freak you out. So it was me and um, John Hamilton. Wow. Very cool. In the same car. There were five of us, but he and I were in the car together with with the other students. No air conditioning driving from Boise, Idaho, all the way to Seattle for the Frank DeMiro Sound Station Jazz Camp. Oh, my goodness. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. So it was at that camp where I went as a bass player, but they made everybody sing. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I'd always sung anyway because I just, we all sing, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, growing up. So uh, getting to that camp and singing a, a jazz solo, getting two days to learn it and having them coach you and then having the college students play in the band behind mm-hmm. you. And I was just like, Whoa. I, I don't know how this is going to work, but. I need to do this for the rest of my life. Mm. That's that's amazing. And it seems like, because you're such a fantastic educator and teacher, and it seems like that you really had someone that nurtured you uh, from the very start. And so many people, like if, you, if you're in somewhere like Boise or Montana or something, you have to go, like jazz bands at zero period, you know, starts at seven or some kids <laughs> I know, they're like at 6.30 in the morning. So not only are the kids dedicated, but the teacher has to really want to do it because that's yeah. that's early. And most most places are like that now here. Yeah. Yeah. I noticed that when I was in uh, the U.S. in February, did a bunch of workshops and stuff in the Northwest. And mm-hmm. yeah, you walk in the room at seven and they'd already been playing for a half an hour. I know. And it's like, how do you not only just play jazz, but it's like, how do you just play oh, at that early how do you in the get morning? Out of- <laughs> so, but I just I have so much respect for the teachers and the students that do that mm-hmm. and I mean they're they're in there they yeah. they support each other they're alert they're there's no bad attitudes mm-hmm. I mean they're just super on it yeah it's not yeah it's that's inspiring incredible. um so when did you get your hands on an upright bass um well, it kind of, kind of, uh, uh, second half of my junior year, I realized I wanted to go to music school and, um, I figured I couldn't get a degree in electric bass. So I thought, well, if I'm going to do the legitimate thing, I should do upright, mm-hmm. but I had my units already full. So the orchestra, luckily, uh, we were back in Montana at this point and the orchestra director was kind enough to let me join the orchestra after school. Mm. So I would come in before school and he showed me how to like hold the French bow and I would drop it all the time. I was like this. It was awful. I was a prolific French bow dropper. 
but I was back there sawing away and, you know, trying to get it together mm-hmm. and, you know, didn't know anything about the repertoire, didn't, um, you know, try to apply to schools. Mm-hmm. And in Montana at the time, the school that you really wanted to go to for jazz education was uh, University of Northern Colorado. Okay. Because, uh, Gene Aiken was the jazz guy there, but they also had a really good classical program, a great music education program. Um, and my mom wanted me to get a degree in education. So I could perform all I wanted to, but the degree should be in education. Smart mom. Yes. Uh, but my family had no money. <laughs> so I had sent an audition tape uh, to Greeley. And it was one of those rare, uh, things where the mail plane with my cassette tape crashed in the Rocky mountains. Oh my gosh. And that was the only tape. So my, idea- yeah. So my tape never made it. They never told me that nothing, they didn't receive anything. Wow. So when I got the financial aid package, I mean, it was just so heavy on the loans and out of state tuition and all that. And I'm the oldest of four. Mm-hmm. So my parents were just like, we love you, but this ain't happening. Yeah. We, we just don't have it. You know, mm-hmm. if we did, we'd send you, but we don't. So I thought for a moment that I wasn't going to go to, to school at all. Mm-hmm. I was working at McDonald's and I was like, I'm just going to work. I'm going to save money. And, mm-hmm. you know, I'll I'll go to Greeley, but I'll, I might have to take a year or two off. Mm-hmm. And uh, right before school started in the fall, the college in our town, Eastern Montana College, um, band director there, his son was in my brother's class at the high school. We mm-hmm. were in jazz band. And so he came by when I was working at McDonald's. And he's like, do you like working here? <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Yeah. <laughs> he says, well, what if I give you a full ride? We'll okay. give you the scholarship. And I already had academic scholarships and things from school. But what if we waive your tuition, you tip, and you're working as the band librarian? Okay. So you're in the music department. You'll get keys to rooms. There's a base there. Um, you know, what do you say? You can still work here, but yeah. at least you're not worried about spending money mm-hmm. and you're not wasting time. You can at least be playing some music. You're like, all right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it, it gave me a chance to, you know, reconnect with an upright. Mm-hmm. And uh, there was no like upright teacher in town. So once a month, uh, somebody from Bozeman would drive in from the orchestra there and work with me. Mm -hmm. But it I wouldn't say it was particularly effective. Yeah. (laughs) It was very dry, very um I don't know. But I tried playing upright in jazz band and I I loved it and I knew I wanted to play that instrument. But you know, I had everything from, you know, bleeding fingers Mm -hmm. and physical pain and more bow dropping and so you didn't have someone yet to really show you this is how you do it from a real bass perspective no no and my my lessons towards the end uh, um were the the most effective ones i had were with the guitar player in town and we got together once a week and we went through real book tunes Mm -hmm. so i mean i could go like blue bossa and just open up the book yeah which based on everything that that you've learned like from John Clayton and, and all that don't open the book Uh, and, you know, use your ears. Nobody ever told me that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, classical theory, I'm sure in the classical theory, I learned about the side or even with the improv classes, it just never really, uh, I never really felt like I had like a very specific this is how you do it. Mm. Or this is how to develop the ears yeah, beyond so you, like a classical you just training kinda class. To, you kind of just kind of figure it out. Maybe I'm doing it right. It, yeah. I just sang along with a lot of stuff. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when we played bassy uh, tunes in the big band, I would try playing with the record and 
you know, things like that. But it was, yeah, it, I felt a little lost in it. I knew I wanted to do it. I was hungry for it. Mm -hmm. Um, we had a guy, uh, Scott Bauer that came in as the jazz guy for my last two years, I think. And, um, he was from California. (gasps) So I was like, yeah, (laughs) Oh, Hey, teach me, teach me. And we did this festival and we'd bring people in and I got to, you know, the student jazz band played with Maynard Ferguson and, Mm. uh, Bobby Shue came up uh, and played with us, and I must have been the most annoying student ever because I just well, these guys would come in, and I'd just be like, "Can I play with you? Yeah, can I play? With you? Tell me what I need to do. Tell me, please, 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 please." Yeah. <laughs> they're just like, "All right, well, you just need to keep playing." Yeah, but what do I need to do? <laughs> it's like, <sighs> so um, I met through Scott. Um, Bert Turetsky, mm-hmm. who was teaching at UC San Diego. And he goes, you need, to, you need to talk to Bert. And I was finishing up my degree, and I was president of music club. And all that meant is that I had access to money. Uh-huh. And so we brought Bert up for like a residency for a couple of days. Nice. And he did a uh, you know, talk uh, for the music students. And he worked with the jazz band and all kinds of ensembles and – I got a bass lesson. I bet that was a little life changing. To say the least. Yeah. yeah. I guess I had to do a, a recital. And even though my, um, my formal lessons were a little weird, mm-hmm. I had to do a classical recital cause it was a very traditional music ed program. Sure. Um, so I had half of the recital that was going to be classical, but I didn't know what material to do. Mm-hmm. All I had heard is like the Dragonetti yeah. was, you know, a must do, but I didn't know thumb position. So I was like first finger the whole way up and down the neck. Nice. Awful. Um, and so Bert picked my material Wow. and he said, well, you sing all the time. I'm noticing half the groups you're singing in and then you're playing all the time. Why don't you try both at the same time? Mm. And here's the, uh, you know, the Betty Rowe, um, Madam and the Minister. There are two pieces for soprano and double bass. And so where you learn the written double bass part and you learn the vocal part. Wow. And I was like, oh, oh, this is cool. Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, all these jazz tunes that I know and I could sing along with all the solos. I was like, what if I put these things together? Mm-hmm. So half of the my senior recital was the classical, and half of it was me singing and playing. Wow, I bet doing too things. that. And that, then that, I went. I did my. Well, I bet that that helped. Like the so singing, singing and playing probably helped get more feel for the music, and also like the theoretical part of it as well, right? That's way too much thinking. <laughs> yeah. For me, it was just fun. It was mm-hmm. really mm-hmm. at the time. It was just like. I felt like I found my voice Mm -hmm. in the music, Mm -hmm. you know, because I still didn't know why I was doing anything. Mm -hmm. It was just Mm -hmm. because that was what I wanted to do. So like theory, building walking bass lines. I mean, I guess I kind of had some of that, but nobody said like transcribe a bass line. Um, I just kind of like sang along with a bunch of stuff. I mean, I had cassette tapes in my car and, so I could sing along with everything, but I think I was thinking still at that time more like a singer, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but I knew I wanted to be a bass player. So two years with Bert really kind of brought it into like a real sharp focus of, all right, we need to validate your bachelors. Mm. Mm. And so it was two lessons a week. Wow. Samandal wow. etude. Oh yeah. The first year was nothing but Samandal. So was Classical this when you were, now you're in San Diego? Yeah, yeah I was 22. So you went from I Montana really felt, to San Diego. Yeah. And it was two lessons a week, Samandal Etude book, um, just to try to get it together. And then uh, the, my master's recital included the Dragon Eddie, knowing how to do thumb position at that point. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then, you know, as I was in that first year, um, in San Diego, I started gigging and Bert kind of threw some gigs my way. And 
So being able to do more of the singing and playing really brought that together. Mm -hmm. Uh, But um, I think it felt so uh, rudimentary Mm -hmm. in so many ways. I mean, really just literally putting the metronome on slow, um, open strings, blues, just trying to get that coordination where I could start to feel some of the freedom in the voice yeah. away from the bass and then, you know, trying to pull the bass in another way. And, um, yeah, sometimes that's some of like, even just rudimentary on the bass or just the voice is sometimes the most fun. Cause at least you have some sort of direction. It's like, well, I know I, I want to be able to do this, so I have to do that. And it's going to take me a certain amount of time, but at least you, it's easy because you have a, a focal, a focal point there. Yeah. That helped a lot. And I also, you know, just for me, it's always been about putting together programs mm-hmm. and those were the things that kind of drove me in those early years. Cause I was really into like Eddie Jefferson. So, and, and Lambert Hendrix and Ross and all the vocalese guys, um, cause I'd gone to a camp, another one where I met Tris Curlis Mm -hmm. and we were both students at camp together and we just spent hours and hours, like at the end of a long camp day, we had our little boom boxes and cassette tapes and she's like, Mo, I haven't heard this. Have you checked this out? And then we would trade cassette tapes. And so like for me, like the whole Eddie Jefferson thing and where the voice could do in a way like the classical part Mm -hmm. and then the bass could stay on the simpler side but I could really explore that kind of more bebop side of, of things and then be able to do a recital or little things in coffee shops and stuff like that. And at that, at that time, like, um, was it a big deal that you were playing and singing for other people or for you? It was probably just like, yeah, this is, I'm doing this. It was a struggle. (laughs) I think, I mean, just, you know, I wanted to, but there's also the panic of um, feeling, you know, away from home for the first time. Mm -hmm. Um, Can I take care of myself? Uh, Those feelings of, you know, when you grow up hearing, like in Montana, it's a very pragmatic place. Mm -hmm. I had my music education degree, um, working on a master's in classical based performance where I took classical voice lessons. I felt like in those two years of graduate school, I had two years to be able to pay my bills Mm -hmm. and not have to go back to Montana and live with my parents again. Yeah. I mean, the door is always open. They've always been like, come back anytime. (laughs) You know, there's no failure. Just come on home. And for me, it was like, I've got to, I've got to try this. I've got two years to see how I can get into that. So it was really so much more about um, just playing jobs. Mm -hmm. And so like I was doing three nights a week at a little restaurant. It was acoustic. That was really a great thing Mm -hmm. uh, because we just did tons of tunes, me and a guitar player, me and a keyboard player. Um, I would walk in with my bass and the guy would be like, you're too loud. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was no amplification, nothing. So like if I would just sing softly, that was enough. Wow. And you can make all the mistakes. You could do all the errors or try things. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it was a restaurant. So nobody was really listening or caring. Yeah. Um, and then I got a gig at the Tory Pines. Um, it was a Hilton and it was a Sheraton mm-hmm. uh, by the golf course there in San Diego, in La Jolla. And I met Shep Myers, this piano player uh, who's passed away years ago. But older guy that had been on the scene in San Diego for ever and a day. And he kind of took me under his wing and really said like, uh, you need to start memorizing tunes. Oh, okay. So that, that was the person who kind of helped you do that. Started that. that. Yeah. <laughs> but I didn't know how to memorize. So I was just really literally memorizing tunes, you know, just by watching his left hand okay. and just holding on for dear life. Yeah. Um, you know, for four hours every Sunday. Mm. And sometimes depending on what the hotel was doing, you know, other things as well. Mm -hmm. 
So, but I think as far as like putting things in the perspective of what the theory is and doing it in other keys and all that stuff, that was Ray. Okay. So that's what I want to talk about. How'd you get from, I mean, San Diego to LA, that's, it's not that far, but there, there are two different worlds. So how'd you make your way into, into Los Angeles and getting to meet, not just meet Ray Brown, but work with him and, you know, he helped you with your first record. How, how'd you get to Los Angeles? Well, that was while I was still in San Diego <clears throat> meeting okay. Ray, um, because he was really amazing about how, like when he would do his touring, he was, um, he had the same schedule. So mm -hmm. he always came to San Diego for a week. It was like the second week of April every year. And so he had those patterns with the clubs and the people that booked and mm -hmm. all that. Uh, and so the first year that I was in San Diego, I was like, Ray Brown is coming to San Diego. Whoa, I have to, I have to check this out. I mean, he was married to Ella Fitzgerald. Wait, and yeah, in that point, what did you, <laughs> what did you know about Ray Brown? He was married to Ella okay. Fitzgerald. Yeah. <laughs> and he was on all my favorite <clears throat> recordings, but I, the enormity of his impact in the jazz world, um, I, I was naive and I didn't completely understand or really get the depth of it. Mm -hmm. And I think in some ways that was probably a plus yeah. because then I didn't get freaked out about it. Mm -hmm. But it was uh, the trio he had with Jeff Hamilton and Benny Green. Nice. And it was that uh, Don't Get Sassy album had just come out, I think. Mm -hmm. And just to feel the air move. I, of course, they were calling me the kid at the club because I would sit at the front table, yeah, front and center with my Diet Coke, and I would just sit there and just stare until they probably felt very uncomfortable. <laughs> uh, but I would just watch and listen and just to feel that dynamic of the three of them playing. And I would go every night. And that first round that they were in San Diego where I was there for it, um, I got up the nerve to talk to Ray and he was in the back of the club in this red uh, plush hotel chair. And I don't know what had happened that day if he'd lost his golf game or whatever, but he was not in the best of moods, mm -hmm. a little cranky. And somebody must've given him the heads up that this young kid wants to meet him and yeah. get a lesson. And so I went up and, oh, oh, Mr. Brown, oh, wow, it's such an honor to meet you. And, oh, oh. and he, I went to shake his hand. And he grabbed my hand and felt my, my fingers. Oh, yeah, to see if you're serious. He said, you need to practice more. Wow. So that was lesson number one. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Come back when and, you practiced, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was doing a lot of bowing, so which was fine. I, I bought a CD, had him sign it and mm -hmm. kept coming back and listening. But I was like, all right. So if I want this lesson, I've got to, I've got to really do some homework. Mm -hmm. So I've scheduled for myself a, a recital the week after mm -hmm. his next visit. And during the course of the year, I was working on the material for that. I was, um, I read the Oscar Peterson autobiography oh, a jazz so I could find yeah. out how yeah yeah so I wanted to find out like how does this guy think what's important to him what's mm -hmm. you know like what does he have for breakfast or whatever <laughs> yeah, I could of course you know what does it mean to be a jazz musician because if this is something I really want to do you know I want to live breathe eat sleep it mm -hmm. and the closest that I had ever come to that before was jazz camps mm -hmm. um and then, of course, with graduate school, you know, it was kind of split between my, my jazz life was like the on the side thing. Mm -hmm. It wasn't yeah. the stuff I did at school. So um, it was really a year of focusing on those things. So when Ray came back, I could I went up and I had a CD from Bert Turetsky and I was like, hey, Ray, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. I'm Kristen Corb. And Bert Turetsky says, hello, I've got a CD for you. Like Bert, oh man, he's crazy, and you know, he started, you know, just kind of talking. I was like, all right, all right, all right. Yeah. So I, was like, I know you're really busy, but 
I was wondering if maybe between your rounds of golf, I could get a lesson. I have a recital next week and I love working with Bert, but I need another, I would really like to get another point of view Mm -hmm. on, on what I'm doing. Little scowl. Tomorrow. Yeah. That little, like, kind of like, all right, what's up with, what's up with this? You know, tomorrow, Mm -hmm. five o'clock. Yeah. So I was like, yay. All right. Great. See you tomorrow. So I went home and, uh, came back the next day at five o'clock on time, ready to go. And I was still at that point. I mean, I could, I could memorize lyrics. I could transcribe scat solos. I could, I I felt more comfortable in the vocal realm, Mm -hmm. but like bass wise, I had all my papers. It was kind of before I started really doing anything in finale. So everything was handwritten and Uh in the, the plastic sheet protectors. And, you know, I had the program in the, you know, so I had my book, but, um, I, I had no idea how to memorize chord changes. Mm -hmm. I was really, it it, it was painful for me. Mm. And I I couldn't figure out how to wrap my head around it because I was transcribing vertically. Yeah, I see. So, um, in the lesson I sang and played for him. And at one point he grabbed the bass from me and, you know, give me that, you know, it was like going through, any number of versions of my funny Valentine. And I'm just the whole time thinking, Oh, I wonder if he did this with Ella. Oh, oh. my gosh. Oh my gosh. But it was just so much fun. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was just so, um, uh, of uh, all of a sudden I'm thinking in Danish, why did that happen? <laughs> uh, just life affirming. And, and so like elevating that he, bothered to take the time with me Mm -hmm. yeah he never said like you're great or you know or anything I mean he just he gave me his time yeah and during that lesson I said you know look I'm finishing my master's I have a degree in music education um I know I can teach Mm -hmm. and, and I'm comfortable with that but I love the bass he looked at me. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, not as much as you, but I want your life. Yeah. I want to tour. I want to do outreach. I want to record. I want, I want those things that you do. And I said, I just don't know. I'm from Montana and I know I'm starting this late technically on the instrument. Um, but I want to know if I'm good enough. Mm. If I'm not, be honest and tell me. Wow. I don't want to waste anybody's time. But if I am good enough, point me in the direction because I'm, I'm ready and Mm -hmm. I will do whatever it takes. So he gave me his address, wrote it down, handed it to me and said, send me your demo tape. Okay. And keep in mind, the last demo tape I sent (laughs) (laughs) ended up on a mail plane that crashed. So I went back to school, got a, a cassette tape burned from like a combo performance Mm -hmm. we had had at school and uh i brought it back to the concert that night and he was like i just said you know you could have just mailed it i was like well you never know with the mail (laughs) service yeah here's here's the thing so but after that i just totally forgot you know like about it i was just i had time with ray Mm -hmm. just to be next to him making that sound to know that you know, the instrument could sound like that and, and to feel it and to, uh, in some small way, make music with him Mm -hmm. on, you know, it was just, that changed everything for me. That was the, that was the affirmation, you know? And so a couple weeks later, I'm in my apartment making tacos and Mm -hmm. the phone rings and it's like, is Kristen there? It's gruff voice on the phone. (laughs) well, yeah, this is she. And I'm thinking like, who is this? Which one of my friends is yeah. messing with me or whatever? And he's like, it's Ray Brown. Wow. And I'm like, <gasps> <laughs> you know, that tape you gave me, it was terrible. Nice. <laughs> I was like, okay. well, well, I'm young. I'm, I'm learning. I'm getting better. They liked you anyway. <laughs> was like, they? Who's they? And it was Telark. Wow. How about if we do an audition? Yeah. 
how about if we do an audition for Telark? I was like, yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> what to do so it's so he was at the chicago um jazz showcase in chicago mm -hmm. and he says buy a you know put a plane ticket on your credit card and i'll reimburse you and we'll do this take care of the hotel and get you in there i was like um mr brown i don't have a credit card <laughs> hmm all right so um, he paid for my flight mm out to Chicago and the guys were on tour and it was one of the last gigs that Jeff played with him mm -hmm. uh, before he took a break and all that. Um, it was before Hutch joined the band and um, yeah, just to be there and the first night was awful and I was just so scared. So I what, just, were, what were you doing? Well, it was what he decided that we would, I would sing one song with the band and then I would play and sing one song by myself. Mm -hmm. And I had been doing, it's impossible to sing and play the bass because Jay Lenhart, mm -hmm. you know, it's just so amazing. And that song is so classic. And so I thought I would do that. And I had worked it out, um, not in my own key because I wasn't doing that at that point. Okay. So I was doing it in Jay's key, <laughs> mm -hmm. which didn't fit me all the best. But it laid okay on the bass. Okay. Um, and I had learned, you know, I had transcribed everything that he did. And mm -hmm. so I thought that would be what I would do. But when I got there, um, I did Peel Me a Grape with the trio. Mm -hmm. And then there was no microphone stand. Okay, for the bass, yeah. Yeah, so like when I'm singing and playing, Ray was like, well, where's the stand? Yeah. You know, just Ray, he just put his arm around me and held the microphone in front of my face. Oh, my gosh. And I flipped. I just, I, <laughs> I might as well have been, you know, that 13-year-old at jazz camp. Yeah. Again. Wow. Scared. And, and I did my best, but it, it, I, I'm glad I don't have a recording of it. I'll okay. just put it. it. That went down on the airmail uh, plane um, as well. Yeah, that was a crash and burn. Yeah. <laughs> but um, Ray was really nice. Um, Jeff Hamilton's mom was there. She Aww. was super sweet. And um, tell our people were polite and friendly enough. Yeah. And then they left and Ray walked me back to my hotel and said, you know what? Tell our people are gone tomorrow. How about if we just do this again tomorrow for fun? There you go. No, no record people, no pressure. Let's just make some music and have fun. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, that would be so great. Um, if I'm going to be borrowing your bass for that song, may I practice on it tomorrow? Mm -hmm. <laughs> he says, well, you better get there early because I'm playing golf at eight. So I was at his hotel room super early in the morning. Yeah. And, um, practiced the entire it was like four or five hours on one song mm -hmm. uh, until he came back um, you know opened the door oh honey I'm home and then we went and had lunch and he told me stories about how scared he was when he first got to New York and meeting Dizzy for the first time mm -hmm. and and all that stuff and the second night was a million times better and I wasn't as nervous and um uh, yeah, the rest is kind of history. But he'd also had um, a reviewer there mm -hmm. that night, but didn't tell me. Good. The second. And so I got a great review from the second night. And yeah, that raised That's my amazing. hero. Yeah. So he really just saw something because he didn't hear you all that much before that point. No. So he just, it was more like a feeling that he probably got from you, like your determination, like I'm going to do this, you know, one way or the other. Yeah. And I think, um, I mean, one of the things I played for him, uh, was twisted, mm -hmm. but, and I can't remember whose version it was, but there's one where there's like two choruses of vocal tirade of, you know, in, uh, double like a bus, who's got the window driver on the top, you know, driver on the top wind, but I got to think about them. It's like just this vocal, just talking fast and frantic mm -hmm. and insane. And, and I had timed it out. So by the time the two choruses were done, boom. Mm -hmm. And then I was singing again. 
Um, so I think when I did that for him, he was like, for whatever my other weaknesses were, and there were many, uh, whatever, whatever the other stuff was, yeah. I think he saw that there was potential in what was going on. And when I was away from the bass, I could actually, you know, sing my way through some songs yeah. and not, I had a feeling for the music and I had a passion for it. So when we did the introducing Kristen Korb with the Ray Brown trio, I was just a singer. That's right. Yeah. Which was a really good choice. <laughs> Is there one song on there that you're doing both? Nope. No. Because I is that is that the cover too where the bass is on the cover? No, no, that the Telark one. Um, I'm in a little white outfit with short hair, and there is no bass, no bass anywhere in sight. around. Okay, no bass in sight. Um, yeah, but he had like Connie Condoli, Plaz Johnson, mm -hmm. um, Oscar Castro Neves came in and played. I mean, it was just. While John Clayton came in just to check stuff out and say hi. Mm -hmm. And and I still like just did not completely understand who everybody was. Yeah. You well, know, I don't. Yeah, I was 25 when we recorded. And it seems like you're just you're so great at not only teaching other people, but teaching yourself how to do things quickly as well. I credit Ray. Mm -hmm. I mean, he really you know, having a lesson with him and uh, singing it and thinking, I'm just going to swing the crap out of this after the CD had come out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you know, uh, it was a song Benny he mm -hmm. had written, gave it to me as a, as he referred to it as more of a gift for the CD release party. Mm -hmm. So I wrote a lyric for it. And then when we got together for a lesson, then I would sing and play it for him. And it was in C, which was probably, no, it was in E flat when he wrote it. And so I was doing it in E flat and he says, well, why don't you do it in C? I was like, Oh, and I was doing all this math in my head. And yeah. And I of course made it through like the first three measures and then crashed and burned. And he's like, it's just the wheel, just turn the wheel. And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and so he played through the cycle and I was like, Whoa. Yeah. I mean, that changed everything for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It just is like, oh, okay. Um, took a long time to be able to kind of bring things in around it. But I mean, that's kind of been a cornerstone of my teaching is that yeah. trying to bring things to that real down to earth, no nonsense. It doesn't have to be... Uh, you know, highly intellectual, it's, you've got to really feel and hear yeah. those motions. And then you can build, you know, exactly. or, or deepen the layers on top of all that. But if you don't have that foundation and that feeling for where things go, if you're starting to think there, yeah. you're not going to be able to do anything else. Yeah. If you're thinking from chord to chord, C major, D major, whatever, instead of however you, you like to think like numbers or interval movement, um, you just have so much more freedom once you kind of get rid of all of just one set way of thinking as a bass player, especially, which we all know is so important to be able to transpose like that. Yeah. Cause a piano player can come in whenever he wants to. Yes. And I remember one time you told me in a lesson or, or we were chatting like, well, if I, if I can transpose the key, the piano player should be able to like, you know, on the spot, I want to do this song in a different key. So you should be able to as well. I can, you know, sing and play and do this at the same time. So you need to be able to as well. Yeah. That doesn't always go over as well for them. But I still, I still maintain that that's, if I can do it, really, come on. Let's. <laughs> yeah, let's get real here. Uh, yeah. So the rest is kind of, as they say, is kind of history. I mean, you had the relationship with, with Ray, that mentorship. The record came out and you're in Los Angeles and you're teaching. I wasn't in LA yet. Oh, you weren't. You were still in San Diego. <laughs> I was in San Diego. Yeah. And, you know, I had those visions. I think it was, you know, the, the things that you think when you're 22 or whatever, I mean, the, you know, I just, Oh, I want the, the record deal. I want the agent. Yeah. It'll, it'll 
all, it'll all come. It will all mirror, you know, it'll appear like yeah. out of the sky, you know, or whatever. Um, and when the CD came out, you know, I looked up because you can only look up stuff. The, the internet still wasn't really happening. So you're still making a lot of phone calls. Mm -hmm. And so I called the jazz showcase, you know, I was like the CDs out. Um, you know, I did my audition at your place and it's like, is Ray on the gig? I said, well, I'm guessing not, but yeah. I mean, I can check, call me when you're famous. Click. Nice. Great. <laughs> So, yeah, there was no booking agent. There was no, um, after the CD had been out almost a year, I finally got the reviews because I didn't, I didn't realize they had been, uh, Telarc had a whole file on me, mm -hmm. you know, every review that yeah. came out and those things, they knew how to find all that stuff. And I still was not aware of how things were done mm -hmm. that way. Um, so I had no promo materials for the first year mm. and then I got them and I was like, oh, well, thanks. I could have used that. Why didn't anybody tell me yeah. before? So I was kind of just really not doing much of anything different. Mm -hmm. uh, I was teaching in San Diego at Grossmont Community College. Um, I was playing gigs as much as I could mm -hmm. and um, it had some of that connection back to Frank DeMiro's camp. I had gone to actually an IAJE convention mm -hmm. I've, when it was – you know, the pre-gen days. Yeah. Uh, and that really helped stuff too. Cause when the CD was out, that came out in August of 96. And so the gen convention was at, or IAJE was in January. Mm -hmm. And so I had saved my money and I went to the convention because I knew all my, you know, Frank DeMiro and Dave Bardoon and mm -hmm. all of these guys that were kind of like my, my, choral vocal jazz heroes mm -hmm. were there and I wanted to be able to thank them. Yeah. And I figured I could find them there. And through that, they were like, well, you need to come back to camp <laughs> and teach. And okay. so that opened up that door in meeting all those other people and all the other guest artists that would come through the camp, like Mark Murphy, uh, mm -hmm. Nancy King, um, Steve Christofferson, um, anybody that came through. Yeah. And so I did that for a few years. And so that kind of helped spread the network of those people that would later hire me to do workshops mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, so it kind of like built on these ends. And then, um, I was really feeling like I was basically treading water because <laughs> like I was working all the time, but yeah. I, you know, and I knew I needed some lessons and I knew I needed more work. And then I got the call to do the, um, West coast jazz party mm -hmm. and Holly Hoffman had helped open up that door. I'm sure, <laughs> uh, with Joe Rothman. And so in preparation for that, I started, I wanted to study with Jeff Hamilton mm -hmm. because I wanted to see what, you know, what kind of a bass player he wanted to work mm -hmm. with after Ray for so many years yeah. and really get my groove solid and all that. So he helped me prepare for the West Coast Jazz Party mm -hmm. with you know, know these songs or really be thinking like this. Um, and so he had made sure that I was playing with him and Larry Fuller. Nice. That's a nice rhythm so, section. Oh, it was so nice. Mm -hmm. It just, it's really, really fun. Mm -hmm. And, and I felt safe. Yeah. Because, you know, I had my teacher behind me. I had, you know, I knew what the material was going to be. There were no big surprises. It was, it was an, an, an easy entry yeah. into that. Um, but besides that, I, you know, I, Jeff had said, you know, you should really get some lessons with John. Mm -hmm. John Clayton. Yeah. And so I wanted to do that, but I didn't have money or time because <laughs> I was too busy working. And if I took the time off from work, then I didn't have the money for the lessons. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, I was thinking there needs to be a change somewhere. And I ended up doing a adjudicating at a festival up in Salem, Oregon, mm -hmm. and found out from one of the other adjudicators that there was a university position opening up mm -hmm. in central Washington. And so I auditioned and got the job of um, director of jazz studies wow. at central Washington university. And so I was up there for two years 
And then every six weeks, I would fly down to LA and get lessons with John because I had you, money. You had money and you had the time to take off now. Wow, you were probably still yeah. pretty young then too. I, I took that job at when I was 30. Wow. So, yeah. And I found out a lot about university politics. Yep. Which, yeah. That's a whole and, other thing. Yeah, that was a whole other thing. Um, yeah. <laughs> There's and, and when you have old regimes where people are so iconic in a department mm -hmm. uh, where everything spins around them, whoever that next person is, is never going to stay. Yeah, of course. Never meant to stay. They're never put in that position to stay. So if there's something, if you want the, the new old regime, people that have grown up in that system, mm -hmm. you have to have something completely different. Mm -hmm. That was me. <laughs> yeah. So it was probably the most stressful two years of my life I can't imagine and painful it. and it's traumatic and yeah I'm not going to get into details but but the things that were my saving graces and the things that really kept me together for the two years one was getting lessons with John mm -hmm. because I would memorize material I would do transcriptions I did all the the basic fundamental work in the jazz stuff and with the Raboth book mm -hmm. uh, that I wish I would have done or well, I, I didn't know. Yeah. It before. came at the right time. It came at the right time. It was the stuff I needed. And it also helped me in my teaching mm -hmm. when I go back. Of course. Um, so I mean, it made me a better player and I would just, I would stay at school in my office until like 11 o'clock at night and I'd be there at seven o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also had like a mini fridge in my office. And so students would come in at night and, you know, when all the classes are over and people are jamming or doing whatever. And sometimes we'd jam in the office and sometimes people just, I had like 1500 CDs yeah. just out on display in the stereo system. So they would go and put a CD on or talk or grab a soda and um, having time with them was really a wonderful thing too. Uh, so those two things were really great. Um, and uh, Gordon Foote, who was at McGill University at the time, he was the big band director there. And I think he's assistant dean now at uh, University of Toronto. Mm -hmm. And he still has a jazz band. He's probably one of the best jazz band directors I've ever uh, observed wow. with workshops. And so at one point I got some money from the president of the university to have him come in and work with me. Mm -hmm. And it, so I videotaped big band rehearsals that we had and all that. And then he came in and worked with the band and did a couple of rehearsals with them. And then we went back to my place and put on the videos of my rehearsals mm. with the sound. And he would fast forward and then stop and say, you know, wow. what you did there. Perfect he'd find something else and yeah. go like, don't ever do that again. Mm. That was way too much. You're pointing at too many things. Uh, one thing, isolate a thing, nip it in the bud, then move on. And my last three months of teaching there at Central were some of the most exhilarating days mm. I had with that, uh, with the big band, that we were all in it together, that we were all focusing in the same way. Yeah. Um, that's it amazing because it's like, especially with a big band, it's like running a team, running a basketball team or baseball team or something. You're you're the manager. Yeah, and when I started there, because of the uh, psychological, emotional uh, things that happen when you're the new person, mm -hmm. I was I was the chick singer leading the big band. Yeah, and by the end, we were a team. Mm -hmm. So, well, yeah, I, that I, on that note, I, I kind of feel obliged to ask you because everyone gets asked this question, but like through your time playing bass, was anyone like, what are you doing playing bass? Cause you're a girl or was, was it more just like, this is what I do. I mean, we always get the, you know, the, the fans that, you know, Oh, what's a little girl like yeah. you doing? big thing like that yeah. you know it's like well 
it's just my size. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, we all deal with a certain amount of that, but when I moved back to LA, cause I moved from central cause I thought, I don't know where my next job is going to be, mm-hmm. but I'm moving to LA because I'm, you know, and of course Ray would be up in Seattle regularly. So mm-hmm. I went and heard him and I would, on the weekends, I would also, if I wasn't seeing John and getting lessons mm-hmm. in LA and hearing the music down there, um, I would go into Seattle, which was an hour and a half over the mountains mm-hmm. and drive over and go to jazz alley and hear Ray and Jeff mm-hmm. and uh, Christian McBride and whoever was playing that weekend, I would just be there. Yeah hang out and, you know, fill my soul yes. so I could come back on Monday and, and give something to the students. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So like when I got to LA, I think I had a tougher skin mm-hmm. yeah. coming down and, and I, you know, when you're in, live in San Diego, there's a certain thing you hear like, oh, LA is really rough and LA is bad mm-hmm. people and people is, you know, industry people just want to take advantage of you, and blah, 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 yeah. which I'm sure is there. There's definitely that side of mm-hmm. it. Uh, but I think because I was ready for everybody to be nasty and mean, mm-hmm. uh, not that I was abrasive or anything, but I think I was prepared. Yeah. You, for, had, you had a shell, you had a thicker skin, you had experience. Yeah. And I felt like you can't hurt me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so um, Luther Hughes was my very jazz father mm-hmm. coming into L.A. and knew him from when I was coming up from San Diego for things. And he uh, threw some work my way when I moved to town. Um, I was staying in Michelle Weir's back house mm-hmm. and doing a little assistant work for her nice. uh, to help ends meet. I was doing a bunch of jazz camps that summer that I moved back. Um so trying to bridge that gap and then going back up into the Northwest mm-hmm. to play concerts yeah, and do those things to just until I could get more integrated into the LA scene. Um, but there was a gig I played at Charlie O's where I will not mention the drummer's name. Um, older guy. Um, I was called to be the bass player mm-hmm. would not even say hello to me. Yep. Just looked at me. Set up and said, hi, I'm Kristen. Held up my hand. Wouldn't yeah. shake my hand. Just cold. And I just thought, all right, sir, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to shove quarter notes where the sun doesn't shine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, by, and by the end of the first set, he was, you know, oh, oh do you want to go out on a date? Yeah. Like, no. <laughs> no. No, no. No, no, no. And that's not a um, compromise. No. And th- those were the days yeah. too, um, where you'd go to Charlie's or the lighthouse or Sangria's and you didn't know who was playing. It was just fun yeah. because you got either it was a last minute fill in or someone else, you know, the club owner or something organized everything. So you you had to co- go there and being like, okay, I, I know everything I'm going to do. I don't care who's playing, what someone's going to throw my way. You, just being confident. Yeah. So that was, yeah, I met like through the lighthouse and, and all that, um, so many musicians mm-hmm. that really just, uh, opened those connections. And I'm really great, grateful to Ozzy Kadena for opening mm-hmm. those doors and, and Gloria, his wife who mm-hmm. took over when he passed. And I mean, just the whole, um, being able to be in there with them. Mm-hmm. Exactly. It, um, so I mean, you're in LA. I mean, I, I met you when you teaching in Port Townsend with uh, you were playing with Nancy King, and uh, so I, I knew you mostly from LA. And and you were teaching at USC. And how did you make it's? You were all over town. You were like the the bass player. So how did you make that? How did you decide to make the move? Okay, I'm going to Denmark now. Well, that was love. Okay. <laughs> Um, Morton and I met on a jazz cruise in the Caribbean mm-hmm. and, um, I had been on the cruise five years before that, five or six years before, um, was supposed to be with my group, mm-hmm. but it ended up being something else, but it was my sets. Mm-hmm. But this time, uh, in, t- is it nine? I was there and Morton, my husband was actually doing sound in the big room. 
Okay. And I was doing all star stuff. So I was putting the, you know, kind of the mixed collection with Ken Popowski mm. and wife Gordon and Kenny Drew Jr. and, and all that stuff. So, um, I got the first night on the big stage and Morton came up with his microphone on bended knee, just being a smart aleck. Yeah. I'd never met him before. We were on the same ship five years before, mm -hmm. never met each other, never crossed paths. And he was like, Oh, Kristen, welcome back on the cruise. You know, it's really great to see you. And, I'm like, I met you? Oh. and then, you know, he gets up there to put the microphone on my base and he gets on bended knee, you know, cause that's where you clip it on the yeah. base. Anyway, but he was like, may I clip this on your base? <laughs> that is the worst pickup line I've ever heard. You may do that, but I'm watching you. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, we became friends and then more than friends and, uh, did a year and a half of the long distance thing. Mm -hmm. And when it kind of became obvious that this is the person I really want to spend the rest of my life with, um, you know, he has two kids, he has a, a microphone company. Um, I had to really look at, you know, like, well, mm -hmm. um, I was rooted in LA. I loved every minute in LA, mm -hmm. the teaching, playing, the, just the randomness that LA brings, mm -hmm. you know, um, people that you just run into in the weirdest places yeah. and gigs that, you know, you can play some amazing concert and the next day you're, you know, in, in a hotel lobby and, yep. Um, it's, it's very humbling, but also like really energizing because you're also playing with like great people all the time. And, um, I loved it. Mm -hmm. So I had to really like look at myself and go, well, if, if I'm going to give up all this, if I'm going to give up university positions. If mm -hmm. I'm going to give up, you know, not necessarily the connections with the, the fans or my fellow musicians, but there is a lot to be, you know, if you're just going to come back and do concerts once or twice a year, um, it's a different thing Yeah, to be in a totally different market where I don't know anybody. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't even know what names to look up because it was just, everything was new. Yeah, But I knew like when it came down to it, I wanted to be with Morton mm -hmm. and I figured I've reestablished myself when I moved to San Diego, yeah. when I moved to LA, I can do it again. Mm -hmm. And, and at least you know, now I could do it with unpacking all the boxes, Yeah, not having to uh, have some kind of underlying fear of not being able to take care of myself. Mm -hmm. yeah. Where I think in my twenties, there was a lot of that fear kind of drive decisions and driving the need to practice. And, mm -hmm. and now it's like, it's such a joyful, uh, I get more done. I, I feel better about myself. Yeah. And I, and I think some of that just comes with age too. You mm -hmm. know, the more you do, the more you build your confidence and the comfort in your, in your own skin. Yeah. Yeah. And luckily Denmark has such a rich history of not just jazz, but like housing American jazz musicians. So it was probably a nice fit for you, right? Yeah, it's it's been a great place. I mean, the audiences are super open. Um, but, you know, coming in as a bass player, this is the land of Nils Hemming. Mm -hmm. So there's a little bit of, you know, that mm, bass player, huh? Yeah. <laughs> oh, you're from the Ray Brown school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's room for everybody. Yes, yeah. But oh. uh, I've found the musicians are super supportive. Yeah. I mean, everybody's been really nice. But it did take a long time for me to kind of figure out, like, the names of who's doing what and where the clubs are mm -hmm. and um, which clubs fit with my musical profile yeah. and and all that. So And finding who to play with, you know. Yeah. I mean, I had a band with Lou, uh, Lou Matthews and Steve Barnes for mm -hmm. five years. Yeah. So it was like, okay, now I've got to find out who I want to play with. and But that kind of makes I it exciting, right? Yeah. Oh, it would totally exciting. But, you know, while I was trying to also learn how to be a stepmom to two kids. That and were, learn Danish. 
and learn Danish and be eight hours, you know, eight time zones to nine hours, uh, nine hours away from, you know, all my family support, all my mm-hmm. friends support. Um, yeah. It was the, the first two years were exhausting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But from, from other people I've talked to who have a, a positive experience like you do moving to another place. Um, some people either have the thought like, well, if I'm not on the scene back where I was before, everyone's going to forget me. But I think now, especially with, with the internet, you know, everything's so available. I don't think, and I definitely don't think that you have that issue at all. I haven't, but I, you know, I'm also not looking at new markets in the U S yeah. I've been kind of going back to the, to the places where it's comfortable mm-hmm. because I'm, the, you know, I've taken the time in my career i uh, you know, more on the West coast that I like to learn the names of the people that come to my concerts. Yeah. And so, you know, I want to reconnect with those people. I mm-hmm. want to see them and I want to hear what's going on in their lives and their families. And so, I mean, for me, that's been part of, if I only have so many days that I can travel at a time, mm-hmm. uh, want to get back and all that. Um, and Morton travels with me and does my sound, which is luxurious. That's great. Um, it's very nice. Um, so I have stayed mostly to the West Coast and mm-hmm. haven't explored as much of the East Coast things as I would like to do at some point. But I had been planning on it and then COVID. So yeah. what you going to do? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, well, I don't have too many more questions, but you're also such a great like community leader, like you're saying when you were at, at central Washington, like you had the mini fridge and you had your students come in. I remember when I was a student of yours and you were teaching at USC, you'd have all your, your students come over and like do recitals and you were, you'd cook for them. And you were, uh, you were the president of ISB or right. The president. Yeah. And, uh, international society of basis. Let me be proper, but you, you have such a wonderful giving communal vibe. So that's one question, I guess, why? And then my second question is, why do you think bass players love to cook? <laughs> I think every bass player I know loves to cook for other people too. Okay, I hadn't thought about that. Um, but the reason for taking care of people, I mean, it's that's that's what we're supposed to do. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, there's so much more that you get out of that. The more we serve others. Mm-hmm. the yes. more we get in return. And, and for me, it's not a burden. It's, I love mm-hmm. seeing people smile. I love uh, people knowing they're not alone yeah. in this, you know, like when the students can perform for each other at the apartment or, you know, they, when I was in Washington, I would throw down some like little challenges with the yeah. cycle We exercises. So whichever section could make it through the exercise best that week, mm-hmm. got dinner house Mm. so we would do things like that yeah and um I just think it's really important and like what Ray had told me at one point too is like you know when I'm helping you Mm -hmm. it's because somebody else helped me right and so you're gonna be helping other people Mm -hmm. I mean this is the tradition this is part of what the music demands of us yeah and I just I just love it. I love connecting people with each other. I love uh, going like, oh, you're going to love this person. You yeah. don't know yet, but you guys are going to just adore each other. You should play together or you should, you know, and, and food is just such this nice common denominator where like you, you can't be defensive when you're eating. Yeah, because you're eating. You're eating. And that's, that brings joy. And especially when the food is good and you have to take some time to just taste and smell yeah. and, and, and the conversations that can come across the table with that and the jokes that get told. I mean, I'm sure you have your share of stories from being on the road. That's around meals. Yeah. You yeah. know, it's not necessarily the notes that were played on the bandstand. It's all the other wonderful stuff. And sometimes the not so wonderful stuff that happens around it. Mm-hmm. Well, and I think that was one of the things I especially learned from you. Cause I remember having a lesson with you and I, I don't, I just was not having a great day or, or something. And you just said, look, let's just talk. And you had like a, a crock pot of like pumpkin stew or soup or something going. Oh, my pumpkin soup. <laughs> yeah. And we just, you know, 
ta- you know, talked it out and then, and then got to the music. So this is something I really learned from you is just, you know, be compassionate, not because, but because you are helping somebody else and that's going to help you. Yeah. Well, and it makes the music better, Mm -hmm. you know, and uh, playing music, it's a language and we communicate with each other. It's, it's through the notes, but it's, it's intention, it's hearts, it's, um, you know, all the, all the noises that we make on our instruments, whether it's voice or bass or all that stuff, it doesn't mean anything Mm. if it's not done with loving intentions, Mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. You know, because for all the things that we play and, you know, we, we practice and we want to get our technique together and we want to, if we don't tell stories with compassion and love, then no point then it's there's really no point in it yeah. and and i think you know as a teacher and and just as you know it might even be with your bandmates if somebody's having a bad day mm-hmm. it's really hard to to get it together and bring it to the music yeah. and that can cloud but if there's understanding and all those other things around sometimes a good bowl of soup sometimes <laughs> a you know just a hey let's talk it out i mean yeah. that it it's just being human yeah well, not everybody's human, Kristen. But you are. We are. We are all human, <laughs> whether we want to admit it or not. <laughs> um, we we, we need not, to embrace that and not run away from it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, thank you so much for for chatting with me, taking the time today. Um, what what are you working on? What's coming out? I know. Tell me about this. Um, the blonde bass. It's been an experiment where it's with uh, two other singing bass players. Um, I think, of course, I've got wheels spinning. So when you get to Denmark, we need to do something. Um, do I need to get a wig or hair dye? No, 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 no. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll call it something else. But, um, but it's just, it was one of those things I met Hilla Marstrand at, at a meeting for a composers group that I was a part of, uh, an organization. A, D, D J B F A. It's some Danish writer, songwriters thing. Mm-hmm. So you can get money for your songs. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's kind of like ASCAP, BMI, CODA, but it's an organization just kind of outside that. Okay. Um, but they'll fund projects and stuff like that. Uh, but Hella was working in the office, but also playing music and doing her thing. And she said, Oh, well, you're a singing bass player. I'm a singing bass player. I was like, Well, let's get together and try something. And she was like, Hey, I'll call Ida Ville and see if she can do it too. <laughs> so we had everybody in the house. And of course we made lunch because mm-hmm. that's what we do. Um, and Ida didn't realize she was going to have to sing so much because <laughs> she hadn't really, I mean, she sings a little bit, but it, it hasn't primarily been her thing. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, we started doing some, little things of from base camps and mm-hmm. things like that. I've got some little arrangements and so we started doing some of that and they brought in their own material. And so we started to kind of figure out where we can incorporate the voices in. And, um, some things are songs that are really vocally driven, three part harmonies. Mm-hmm. Um, and some things we share the melody across the band. And then with solos, we switch off and who's accompanying and who's, you know, yeah. Uh, who's soloing and who's might maybe doing percussion or some other harmony parts. And and then other things are just flat out, you know, just bass ensemble things. Mm-hmm. And it's been really fun to be with them. And um, it's, it's another way of, you know, really kind of keeping honest with the music. Yeah. Um, I mean, playing with just one other bass player, but two other bass players and two other singers, that's a whole other thing. Yeah. And then, you know, pulling out bows because, you you know, you got to try to change the textures enough so that it makes sense mm-hmm. because we want to be able to give people something where it's not just the same thing mm-hmm. for two hours. So um, it's been fun to explore the possibilities. Yeah. And uh, we've, been, we've actually got five concerts in the next like couple of weeks. Oh, that's fantastic. All so, in Denmark? Yeah. yeah. Very cool. Got that. And then my trio with... Uh, Magnus Stewart and Snorkirk, we're doing, um, had a couple of days of uh, recording here at the house. Oh, nice. Yeah. We've got some good microphones. <laughs> and 
<laughs> and my husband is part of his COVID project has been to uh, change over one of the kids' rooms because they're out of the house now mm-hmm. and on their own. So this is now the studio for mixing and all that. Very cool. So, uh, yeah, he runs a snake out into the living room by the piano. And mm-hmm. so we've done uh, a couple of days recording. We're going to do some more on Monday just to kind of see where things are and mm-hmm. what we need to do. Um, so hopefully there'll be something coming out in the spring. Awesome. Well, I know I'm looking forward to it. Woohoo! <laughs> well, thank, thank you, you so much, Kristen. Thanks for, for joining us on the hump. Really appreciate yeah. your time today. And, um, we miss you in the States, but it's, it's so fun when I get to go to Denmark and we got to see each other a couple years ago. And I know they're very lucky to have you. Thank you. And I'm so glad to see you doing so well and tearing it up and doing your thing. It's just, it makes me, just the teacher heart in me is like, yeah. Well, thank you. I had, a, I had a fantastic teacher, fantastic mentor. You've had many. <laughs> you, it, I mean, it's a really, I think it's it's part of that community too. Mm-hmm. You know, we can't, we can't get it all from one person mm-hmm. and we should. Yeah. The more people that we have in that community around us and, uh, we just keep lifting each other up. So right, exactly. keep up the great work. Awesome. Well, thank you, Kristen. Enjoy your, your beautiful Danish night. I'm kind of jealous. <laughs> All right, well, hang in there care. with all the smoke and everything. Yes. All right. All right. Thanks, Kristen. Bye. You bet. Bye.